Should we start? Okay, I'm not sure. Okay. All right. So today we're going to discuss an approach to the Russia Tikhon and Turayev. Um, this is the third kind of point of view, um, I, guess the, I guess the second and the third point of view of the color Jones polynomial that I would like to present. Um, so this is Russia Tikhon Turaya around 1990. Okay. Um, okay. So to set things up, I want to start with a little bit of algebra. Um, so a Lie algebra. Um, so, which I'll denote like this. Uh, right. So is a vector space. Okay, uh, with a with a Lie bra bracket. Okay, it's a bilinear operation uh, that satisfies uh, some famous identities. X y equals um, minus y x, and the Jacobi identity. The Jacobi identity is. Z plus Y X Z plus Z Y X X Y uh, equals zero. Okay, so you have a bilinear operation um, that that does this, and so. Uh, for example, uh, any vector space can be made into a Lie algebra with a zero Lie bracket, right? So if I just have just declare x y equals zero, um, this is for all x y. Then this is called an abelian Lie algebra. Okay, essentially it's a vector space, right? So every vector space is an abelian Lie algebra. Um, so an ideal. Uh, so is a vector space, so an ideal is a vector space, of, uh, a vector subspace, right? It's a vector subspace closed under uh, this operation, right? So for all, for all x in the Lie algebra. Okay, so a non-abelian Lie algebra is called simple. So if you have non-abelian non-abelian Lie algebra is simple. Okay, uh, if it does not contain any proper ideal. So what we want to focus on is we want to focus on uh, a particular simple Lie algebra, um, which is, so we'll look at SL2, but let me just say right now, uh, SLN1. This is a simple Lie algebra uh, of dimension uh, n squared plus 2n. OK, so it's n squared plus 2n. And uh, you can represent it uh, as n plus 1 cross n plus 1 uh, matrices with zero trace. Okay. So we're going to focus on SL2. All right. This is the, the color Jones polynomial is going to come from representations of SL2. So let me uh, say a, word, a couple of words about representation. So a representation uh, of a Lie algebra rho uh, is into the uh, endomorphisms of a vector space V, of course, such that the representation respects the Lie algebra structure. So what you want is you want rho of the bracket x, y, right, to be rho x, rho y, minus rho y, rho x. Okay. 
I'm sorry? Yeah, it's small g L of u. Yeah. Okay. So, um, and as as Vishak pointed out yesterday, you can see this as a as an action. So we say we will say that g acts on v by rho. So this is a very common notation. And so what this means is this means that the action is x dot v is exactly rho x of v. Okay. Yeah. All right. So now the the Lie algebra that we care about, uh, SL2, uh, has exactly one uh, irreducible representation uh, of dimension n. Okay, for each n greater than or equal to two, which we're going to denote by v n. Okay, so uh, so like for example, if you look at the the standard, this is called the standard representation. Some people call this like the birth certificate representation. The standard representation is the um, v2 is given by then uh, c2, right? And so we have these uh, h is 1, 0, 0, minus 1. e is 0, 1, 0, 0. And f is 0, 0, 1, 0. So these span the Lie algebra. So these span the Lie algebra, and this gives you a two-dimensional representation of SL2. Um, so for example, here's an example of the three-dimensional representation. So this is the three-dimensional uh, representation of SL2 is given by three by three matrices, 0, 2, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0. Zero. I'm sorry. One, zero, zero, two, zero. Okay. So still trace free matrices, but three by three matrices, and these are the ones that satisfy the identities in SL2. Okay. So I don't want to say too much more about. SL2 or in, in this sense. Here's what I want to tell you. I want to tell you uh, how, how to get quickly from this whole business of the representations to not invariance. Okay? So in order to do this, we need to see some more complicated algebras that any Lie algebra gives rise to. So And this is going to build on what Vishak was talking about yesterday. So this is a, a this is perfect. So the the, the segue here. Did I? I'm sorry. So I believe that's correct. I, I believe that's correct. But we're not going to use it, so it doesn't much matter. <laughs> so, okay. So okay. So any Lie algebra gives rise to several different kinds of algebras. One is called the tensor algebra. Okay. The tensor algebra, T of g, is the direct sum right, of n bigger than 0 of g with the n-fold tensor product. All right. So that's the tensor algebra. The other algebra, there's another algebra, it's called a symmetric algebra. Symmetric algebra, S of g, is T of g, where we quotient by uh, the two-sided ideal generated by all <coughs> expressions that look like x tensor y minus y tensor x. So in other words, in the symmetric algebra, x tensor y equals y tensor x. Okay. So the difference between them is that the tensor algebra, right, t of g, 
is a free algebra uh, on the generators of G, right? So all of these generators, what we'll call them EIs. So EIs will be denote the generators of the original Lie algebra. And the tensor algebra is a free algebra on all these generators. And the symmetric algebra is insert the word commutative. Right, it's the free commutative algebra on these generators. Okay? So we need one more gadget, uh, and that's called the universal enveloping algebra. Um, which is u of g. So the universal enveloping algebra is the tensor algebra where we quotient by uh, x tensor y minus y tensor x minus the Lie bracket xy. Okay. So in the universal enveloping algebra, right, this is just saying that the Lie bracket is always going to be expressed in the simplest possible way in the tensor algebra. Okay? So that's, this is a, a statement in the universal enveloping algebra. Now this guy is infinite dimensional. So this is an infinite dimensional algebra with a basis. Uh, that looks like this. So it's all expressions of the form ej1, ej2, up to ejm for j1 up to jm. Okay. This is called the poincare birkhoff witt basis, PBW basis. This is called the PBW basis, the poincare birkhoff witt basis. Um, so it looks like that. Okay. Now, as um, as vector spaces, I should point out to you that so as here. So let me just make a remark here. As vector spaces, the universal enve enveloping algebra is isomorphic to the symmetric algebra as vector spaces, but. Whereas this guy is an abelian Lie algebra, this one is not, because it has a non-trivial Lie bracket. Right? So this is right, so so this is not abelian. Okay. Okay. Why do we care about the universal enveloping algebra? Because Any representation, so any representation rho from the Lie algebra into GL of V extends to a representation of the universal enveloping algebra. Okay? And this is completely obvious because what do you do with the bracket? This just becomes rho of x, rho of y, minus rho of y, rho of x, right? That's, the, that's our requirement for a representation here. But then over here, we know exactly that that's equal to rho of x tensor y minus y tensor x. And so this is all always satisfied. There's no issue. It's like free. You get it for free. So, this is, a, this is an obvious sort of um, statement that you get from the, I don't know, the algebraic nonsense, right? But here's a non-trivial statement. Any representation it's can be. Representation is associative algebras as well as Lie algebra. Right? Yes, I believe so, yeah. Right, this is a, I mean, but this is a Lie algebra representation. Well, the, the representation of the universal and enveloping algebra. It's also associative. Yes. And that's also an associative algebra representation. Yes, you're saying there's more structure there. Yeah. 
Okay. And yeah, since this year we have ten new mayors. Yeah. So yeah, anyway, I, yeah, I, I don't want to. Okay. This is let, let's say this is easy. Okay. But here's a non-trivial statement. Any such representation can be extended with a parameter, right? You can deform it with a parameter, okay? And so this is the point is that you can deform, and this is non-trivial, right, to a representation rho from uq g into glv, okay? And that's a non-trivial statement. So what is that parameter doing? That parameter, right, so this action depends on q. And we also require that uq of g is the universal enveloping algebra if q equals 1. Okay, So that quantized universal enveloping algebra is the one that Vishak was talking about. So at the, at the end of his talk yesterday, he explained how to get uq of SL2. So I'm not going to do that. That's wonderful that I don't have to do that. He did all of the heavy lifting. Okay? So this is a Hopf algebra. It's a, has a, it's a bi algebra, has a multiplication and a co-multiplication, has an antipode and so on, has tons of structure. So UQSL2 is a very interesting gadget that we, we learned about yesterday. And the point is that any representation extends to that representation. That's a theorem. Okay. okay. Now, what to do with this? Why do we care? Right? So this is the point. This is the, the issue. To the, what I want to cover today is the wh wh so what. Okay? So here is the essential property of quantum groups. So the, the, the essential property that I need is the following. So every irreducible representation right, of, of the quantized universal enveloping algebra gives a solution to the Young-Baxter equation. I believe this is Drinfeld's theorem. I'm not positive. It's, it, it, this is Jimbo and Drinfeld are the two names associated with this. I believe this is Drinfeld. So here is the idea. Okay. We take an operator R, which goes from V tensor V to V tensor V. And then the Yang-Baxter equation is the following equation. It is the statement that R, R tensor 1, 1 tensor R, R tensor 1 is equal to 1 tensor R, R tensor 1, 1 tensor R. This is the Yang-Baxter equation. What the heck is it? Who cares? Why is it interesting? And this turns out to be the central point of the entire theory. Everything hinges on this equation. And the, to understand this equation, here is the picture. Okay. These transformations, okay, each of these sides, the left-hand side and the right-hand side, each of these, is um, a transformation from v tensor v, three, a three-fold tensor product, to itself. Right. So it, this threefold tensor product can be seen graphically. Okay? So here's what we're going to do. We're going to put v's here. Okay, here are the threefold tensor product. And we're going to flow. Uh, we're going to pick a direction. We're going to flow up. So we're going to orient our strands to go up here. 
Okay, and we're going to flow up. There's going to be two different kinds of orientations. One is, how do we read our diagrams? I'm always going to read the diagrams from bottom to top. Plus, these diagrams are oriented. Like, for example, uh, this diagram that I'm going to talk about in a moment, the, I'm going to pick some other orientations. Like on this one, I'm going to orient this one down, this one up, this one up, this one up. So, but I'm still going to read it this way. Does that make sense? So there's an orientation on diagrams, plus there's a way to read these things. So let me explain what is going on here. This is a, this is a, a key point, OK? To every crossing, we associate one of these operators r from v tensor v to v tensor v. So at this stage right here, we, we have a v, a v, and a v. This right here is of the form, right? so if I write it like this, This is, this is here going by r tensor 1. Do you see r tensor 1? Okay. Whereas over here, if I look at this layers, le level, level, levels here, this is 1 tensor r. Do you see that? Because this is 1, this is r. And then over here, This is, again, r tensor 1. So over here, the way you would see this is this is 1 tensor r, this is r tensor 1, and this is 1 tensor r. So the statement that these are equal, that's the Yang-Baxter equation, is a Reitemeister 3 move. So you can see these diagrams are equivalent by a Reitemeister 3 move. And the Yang-Baxter equation with this interpretation is exactly a Reitemeister 3 move. Okay. So what we want to do now is, so, okay, so let me say something, so what? Okay, again, so what? <laughs> so here is what you get, right? Well, you get something from this, from your troubles. And the state and the what you get is the following. Okay. Given some R satisfying the Yang Baxter equation, okay, what you get is a representation of the braid group into GL of the n fold tensor product of V depending on the index of the braid group. So the Bn, you get a representation into GL of the n-fold tensor product of V. Yeah? Do you have a negative crossing in, instead of R? What R inverse. R inverse. Good question. I'll talk about that in a, in a bit, OK? R inverse. It's exactly good. Does everybody, did everybody in, uh, hear the question? If we flip the crossing, if we, if we change the crossing, we're in, we're, we need an operator R inverse. All right, so the representation is going to be the following. So I want to, to, so what I need is I need an operator ri, okay, which is going to be, um, so this right, rho of sigma i. Okay, so Ri is going to be this image, rho of sigma i, where Ri is doing what? You're going from this n-fold tensor product to itself. This is Ri. What is Ri? So how do you, what is it? It looks like this. Ri is simple. Ri is exactly 1 tensor 1, as many times as you need, until you get to the position where you want to be, and then you do more i's. Okay? So the point is that in a three braid, in a three braid, you can see exactly what's going on here. Do you see this as r tensor one? 
But if you had a wider braid, you may need more ones. So like, for example, if I put another strand here, I would have one tensor, all of these guys. All right? So these are my ri's. And then what is the Yang-Baxter equation? The Yang-Baxter equation in this language simply says that ri, ri plus 1, ri is equal to ri plus 1, ri, ri plus 1. It's the braid relation. So the Yang-Baxter equation, which is the, this, again, right Meister 3 move, is exactly giving you a braid relation so that you get a braid representation. OK. All right. How do we get an invariant of knots and links? So we've got a braid representation. How do we get a, a link invariant? So the other relation is the one that you pointed out. Okay? So if there's an R inverse, right? So R inverse is going to be rho of sigma R, I guess this is the R I inverse. Would be this one. So I need I need a fellow such that R R inverse is equal to 1. And then that's all. So if I have the braid relation, far commutativity comes for free because of the tensor product. And then I just have this identity. This is the Reitermeister 2 move. Okay. Okay. So now, how do we get a link invariant? Okay. <coughs> so you take a di so you take a more so so take a diagram. with a height function. Okay, if you've studied any Morse theory, this would be a Morse function. You want all of the singular points to be at a separate level, right? You need to kind of a generic condition. And so at these generic level sets, we're going to assign a V or a V prime with the following dictionary. Okay, so if I have an oriented arc then we are going to assign, so we're going to say this goes from V to V. And as I said, we're always going to go from bottom to top. This is going to be going from V to V by the identity on V. This is what I've been calling 1. Okay. On the other hand, if I have uh, an oriented arc like this, then I need the dual vector space going from V star to V star. And so this is going from v star to v star by the identity on v star. Okay. So I'm always going, it's a little confusing. I'm always going from bottom to top on my maps, but the arcs of the diagram could be oriented up or down. All right? Then the key point is this, this, uh, the crossings. Right, so if I go like this, this is from V to V. This is going to be from V tensor V to V tensor V. This is going to be my R. And the other crossing is going to be from V v tensor v to v tensor v by r inverse. Okay. So far, so good? Please stop me if anything is, is confusing. This is a graphical calculus to, tra to transform a framed tangle into maps, right? Maps on vector spaces. OK, this is not enough. I need what are called cups and caps. Cups and caps are for the mins and maxes. All right? So I need a, a few more of these gadgets. So here are the cups and caps. Okay. So 
So if I have this kind of a thing, I'm going from uh, v star to v. Notice because I'm oriented down then up. So it's v star to v. And so this is going from c up to v star tensor v. On the other hand, I could have this situation. If I have this situation, this is v and v star. And so this is going from c to v tensor v star. The other two possibilities are the others. So I could have this situation. This is v and v star. So this is going from. Uh, from C, sorry, from V tensor V star up to C. And the other and the last one, the fourth one, is this guy, which is V star V. And so I'm going up from uh, V star tensor V up to C. Okay. We want to combine these guys like this. So here's a frame tangle. Okay. Let's call this tangle T1. Uh, this is T1. This is T2. All right. And so what do I see here? What do I see here is this is my V star. This is a V. This is a V, a V. Right, so there's a V star and three V's at this level. And over here, I see a V, a V star, a V, and a V. And over here, I just see V and V. Completely graphical. This is like just from the graphic, right? From, just from the tangle. So what do, I, what, do we, what do we have here, right? What we have is this tangle corresponds to V star tensor V tensor v, tensor v, and we have v, tensor v star, tensor v, tensor v, going like this. Okay? Whereas tangle 2 corresponds to v, tensor v, going up like this. So what is it that we're trying to get here? So for each frame tangle, what we want is we want an invariant. Right? This is going to be what we'll call a theta theta of t1 times t2. Right, so this is a way to multiply these tangles. And so what we get is this is exactly going to be theta of t1 composed with theta of t2. So this is the graphical calculus that was invented to turn a framed tangle into an operator. Right, so this is an operator on these tensor products on these, these tensor products of vector spaces. Right? So, so this is the way we do this. OK, how do we get a link invariant using the representation theory and this idea? OK, so we combine all, all of it. So this is going to be one big picture that combines all of this. And of course, it's the trefoil knot. Right? There is only one knot. So here is the trefoil knot. Okay. Yes, exactly right. Okay. Yes, it's everything's framed. Everything I draw on the blackboard is framed with the blackboard framing. So the push off is in the blackboard. The blackboard gives me my framing. Okay. I'm sorry? Here? So we also have those loops, right? So I don't have any loops. I don't understand the, the question. Just in case the tangle was using in between the. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah, sure. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it's a tangle. It's a perfectly nice tangle. 
So your anything you draw will have cups, mm -hmm. caps, or crossings. Right? You just have to put it at a generic level, at a height function. Okay. So you can see there's a cap there at this level. Okay. Then there is another cap at this level. You can see the heights. These are the generic, this is the Morse function. I'm just taking a Morse function on this diagram. There's another, now there's a crossing, is the next one I see. Then I see another crossing. One more crossing, one cap, last cap. Okay. Okay. So how do we interpret this diagram using our calculus? Okay. The way we're going to do this is the following. Okay. So over here where we have nothing, that's C. Okay. Then we have, over here, I see a V and a V star. Oh, by the way, I should orient this diagram. I apologize. So I have to orient it. Let me orient it this way. I've just, I've just picked an orientation. So I'm going to go down this way and down this way. Okay. All right, so I need an orientation on my link diagram. So I start here with nothing. Nothing is C. Then I go to this fellow here, which is V tensor V star. Then I've got here okay. So at the next level, I've got here a, this is a V star, this is a V, this is a V, this is a V star. So up here I've got V star, tensor V, tensor V, tensor V star. Okay. All right. Now at this level we have one crossing, and so we're, we're going to get to we have the same thing, V star V, tensor V, tensor V star. And this crossing, right, so can you see what, what's the operator going to be at this level here? Yeah, good job. That is an R inverse. This is a 1, and that's a 1. Do you see that? So we're going to get 1 tensor R inverse, tensor 1. Okay. All right. Then we repeat this again. 1 tensor R inverse tensor 1. We go up again. 1 tensor R inverse tensor 1. And then we end with, um, and then we go up to uh, V star tensor V, and finally C. Uh, so this gadget here is the cap. So this is the one from V star tensor V to C. Now there, there's one cap. Did I forget a cap? The top one? Yeah, there are two caps. One cap. Oh, so there's one more cap. You're right. I have to do this one more time. Yeah, OK. So, all right. So I need to go to C. I need to go, oh, because I need to contract this. Sorry. I need to contract this guy. So this is going to be V star tensor V, tensor V, tensor V star. And then I contract these to a C, and then I contract those two to a C. Okay, so I have to contract, I have to do two contractions because I've got four spaces there. Okay, when I've got a linear transformation from C to C, that is going to be the Q-valued polynomial. That Q we think of as an 
a, as a complex parameter. So the, the polynomial that we're going to get, which in this case is going to be the color Jones polynomial, is exactly the, one, the linear transformation. The, you know, it's a little weird to talk about a linear transformation from C to C. It's multiplication by a complex number. But that complex number is a certain evaluation of a polynomial where Q is a complex parameter. All right, that's what that's what this machine produces. All right. Q is there in R. That's how Q would. Yes. Yeah. So this is the yeah. So this is the part. So so far, everything I've said has been rather general. Right. This is kind of like where's the specificity, and the difficulty of this entire program. Everything rests on one piece, right? This is all completely sort of the, the, the algebraic machinery just rolls ahead. But what is the m ingredient that we started with? A solution to the Yang-Baxter equation. And it turns out that a solution to the Yang-Baxter equation is very difficult. It's very hard to find solutions to the Yang-Baxter equation. And there's a whole science to finding solutions to the Yang-Baxter equation. So that difficulty, let me show you um, the solution that corresponds to the Jones polynomial. Okay. It's non-trivial. Okay. So this R matrix So this R matrix that we started with that satisfies the Yang-Baxter equation right, looks like this. So we, we want specifically to be on EK tensor EL. We want a sum over I and J, over all admissible I and Js, of the form, something of the form RIJKL EI tensor EJ. So we need that operator, and we need it to solve to be to, to, to work to solve the Yang-Baxter equation. So for n equal to 2, right, then we've got here, let me, let me looks like that. Okay? So for n equal to 2, we v tensor v, let's give it a particular basis, e1 tensor e2. Uh, sorry, E1 tensor E1, E1 tensor E2, uh, E2 tensor E1, and E2 tensor E2. All right. With that fixed basis, we can write down a matrix. So then the representation rho from SL2 into GL of V tensor V corresponding to the Jones polynomial, right, to J2 of L is given by the following R matrix. So this is Q to the 1 fourth, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, Q to the minus 1 fourth, 0, 0, Q to the minus 1 fourth, Q to the 1 fourth minus q to the minus 3 fourths, 0, 0, 0, 0, q to the 1 fourth. Okay? That was going to be my second guess, this one. It's hard. It's hard, to, it's hard to figure this out, right? So there's a science to this. So what this means is, like, what does this column mean? Just so, just so we're all clear on what, what does that mean? That means that if I'm looking, right, so E2 tensor E1, is sent by r to what? Well, it's sent by r to q to the minus 1 fourth, the second basis element, e1 tensor e2, plus this expression, q to the 1 fourth minus q to the minus 3 fourths, e2 tensor e1. OK, so this expression is the image of that element. Okay? It's non-trivial. So this is the particular R matrix that corresponds to the standard Jones polynomial. For the nth color Jones polynomial, 
Um, should I write down? Do you, uh, Hitoshi, are you going to put up uh, the Rijk for the nth color Jones polynomial? You will. Okay, very good, because then I don't have to write it. It's long. It's a very long expression. So I'm going to let, let Hitoshi do that. Okay, he's going to do all the heavy lifting. Okay. Now, the theme of the first lecture and the second one was that the framing requires an adjustment. Right? If you have a twist, you're going to need uh, an, some kind of an adjustment to account for that framing change. Same thing goes here. Everything here is up to framing. When you put in a twist, you need to adjust for it, and that's called an enhanced Yang-Baxter operator. The enhancement is complicated. I'm going to let Hitoshi handle that one. Okay? So everything difficult, he will explain. But the point is, the main idea is the same. You have a framed tangle operator. It, does not, it depends on the framing, and so you need an enhancement to adjust for the framing. Okay, So we'll see that. OK, so now the point is that with this R matrix, right, with a particular solution to the Yang-Baxter equation, right, we get the following thing, right? So for GSL2 and a representation rho from SL2 into Vn, right? This is an n dimensional representation. We produce, using this machine, this device, the nth color Jones polynomial, Jn of L in the parameter q. So I've omitted the enhancement for the framing adjustment, but here is the state sum formula then. What it looks like is a sum over all labelings so you have a diagram. You're going to put a bunch of labelings here that are the admissible labelings. These are just numbers. You can do this in Mathematica. i goes from whatever, from 0 to n minus 1. j goes from 0 to n minus 1, right? All of the numbers. Put little numbers in, all of which are indexed from 0 to n minus 1. It's a giant mess that, that a computer can handle. So sum over all labelings. Then you're going to take the product over all crossings. Right? Every time you see a crossing, you're going to put in some R matrix of the form right, i, j, k, l. I'm sorry, I guess it has to be plus or minus 1. So it uh, depends on the sign of the crossing, right? So r plus or minus 1, i, j, k, l. And then you need to also multiply by a product over all caps and cups. Of these mu mn's, right? There are some labelings here, m's and n's. So you have a diagram. You sprinkle all possible labelings from zero to n minus one, completely combinatorially, right? It's all finite. Everything's finite. And then you take this sum with these R matrices given to you in this way. This particular, these are matrices. These are large matrices. So you take these large matrices and multiply them. And then you've got these cap and cup operators that are also matri can, can be given as matrices. And then you multiply them. And I've omitted the enhancement. There's an enhancement here for the framing. And it's a completely large, finite sum. And that gadget will have Qs everywhere in it. And the output is the color Jones polynomial. Hitoshi will explain all of that, Okay, how to do, how to do this procedure. Okay. So, yeah, so the labelings are basically you put, you put little, you, you, you are, right? Yeah, so I've, it's this. So if I want to go from, I, I want this R matrix here, right? So I've got, I need to explain what happens on the KL guy. So K, K tensor L. 
that is given to me as a sum of i, j, k, and l's over all i, j fellows. So you get expressions that look like this. So what happens is you need to put these labelings, these i, j's, k's, and l's, on all of the different places on the strands. It's a multi-sum. It's a multi huge sum. Huge sum. Every time you do it, you're going to get q's everywhere. Everything's parameterized by these q's. So this is the state sum. Remember how we saw the state sum for the Jones polynomial? This is the state sum for the color Jones polynomial. So yesterday, we saw the Jones-Wenzel idempotence. That's a completely different way to compute this guy. So that's a way to compute it using the skein theory. The, the, this is the analog of the axiomatic Kaufman bracket. This is the analog of the state sum Kaufman bracket. It's the state sum for the color Jones polynomial. All right, let me end with one more. This is, so this is interpretation number two. Let me end with the third interpretation of the color Jones polynomial. And the third interpretation of the color Jones polynomial is due to Kirby and Melvin. And that's the cabling formula. Yes. Yes, yes. It's the cups and caps. So yeah, let me explain. So this is the cabling formula, right? So this is the, this is the, in many ways, the cabling formula is conceptually easier. This, so this is kind of the easiest approach to the color Jones polynomial, but computationally useless. So let me, let me show you what, what it is. So this is Kirby Melvin cabling formula. <coughs> and it was right around the same time as Reshetikin and Turayev, around 1990, plus or minus a, a year. Um, so the idea here is the following. So this is a representation theoretic statement. And that is the statement that the n-fold tensor product for um, SL2 has a very special, SL2 is very special, right? SL2 is, is easy. And the n-fold tensor product can be expressed as a linear combination of um, Right, it's a linear combination of, of these guys, right, of the two-fold tensor product. So the n-fold tensor product can be expressed as a linear combination of two-fold tensor products. So, so here's a notation. So I'm going to use the following notation. Okay. So if we write something like 2v plus uw, all right, what I mean by that is I mean by that that this is going to be v plus v plus u tensor w. So I'm going to use this notation just to simplify things. Does that make sense? OK. So, or something like, for example, if I write u equals v minus w, all right, that is exactly, right, okay. so this is exactly going to be the statement that uh, u plus w equals v. All right? So I'm just, I just need a little bit of notation, because I want to get rid of the pluses in the tensors. And something like v to the n is exactly going to be the n-fold tensor product. So, with, so this is some notation that I need. All right? So in this notation, then, here is the theorem. This is the theorem that Kirby and Melvin proved that v n plus 1, so this is the n plus 1 tensor product right, of v, right, is going to be equal to the sum from j equals 0 to n over 2 of minus 1 to the j 
n minus j choose j v squared to the n minus 2j. OK, there are signs here, pluses and minuses. There are coefficients here, the binomial coefficients. And there are some products here. You have to interpret that using this notation. Yeah, I guess I have to do that. OK. So for example, let me show you the example. So here's what this looks like in practice. So if I want, this is all for SL2. This is all for SL2, very special to SL2. V3 is V2 tensor V2 minus V1. So the three-dimensional representations, the higher dimensional representations of SL2 can be expressed as linear combinations of low of, of just two-dimensional representations. For example, v4, using this formula, is v2 tensor v2 tensor v2 minus 2 v2. v5 looks like this. This is v2 tensor v2 tensor v2 tensor v2. OK. so. 8 minus 3 v2 tensor v2 plus a v1. The numbers add up. Okay? So you get that kind of thing like this, etc. So here is the corollary. So this is again a pure statement about higher dimensional representations of SL2. The corollary is for us, which is the cabling formula. Right. Since the nth color Jones polynomial comes from the nth n dimensional, uh, I guess n plus one dimensional representation of SL two. Right. I'm, I'm, I'm off by one. The n n plus first color Jones polynomial comes from the nth dimensional representation. Okay. So you get the cabling formula of the following form. Right. So this is uh, the, the standard Jones polynomial. So Jones is J two. Just so keep that in mind. J2 is the standard, is the Jones polynomial. So we get. So use n plus one dimensional? Yeah, I've been, I, I've tried to be, one. yeah, I've tried to be careful. So n plus one gives me the nth color Jones polynomial. So j n plus one of k is going to be the sum of j equals zero to n over two of minus 1 to the j, n minus j choose j, of the Jones polynomial, right, j2, of the cable, n minus 2j. So easy. How easy is that? The nth color Jones polynomial is a linear combination of values of the Jones polynomial of cablings all the different cablings. This kind of matches our jones wenzel idempotent point of view, where, where we put in the idempotent and those required cabling. Right? Every time you put a little idempotent in, you need n strands. So how do you, right? So, so how easy is this? We don't have to even think about color Jones polynomials. We just take these linear combinations of Jones polynomials. What's the problem? Why bother doing all the rest of this stuff? Okay. So by the way, I guess I should just let me just write this out. What does this mean? So the third color Jones polynomial of a of K is going to be the standard Jones polynomial of the twofold cable minus one. Just subtract off one. The fourth color Jones polynomial of K is going to be the Jones polynomial of the threefold cable minus twice the Jones polynomial of K. The fifth color Jones polynomial of K is the Jones polynomial of the fourfold cable minus three times the Jones polynomial of the twofold cable plus one. Yeah, you see how we're doing this? So 
what we get then, right, so here's a figure eight knot. If we start taking cablings of this thing, that's a two cable. That's nice. Here's a three cable. Here's a four cable. What just happened here? What happened is every time I get a crossing, I've now replaced it by 16 crossings. Every crossing just got replaced by 16 crossings. The entire procedure for computing the Jones polynomial is exponential in the number of crossings. Your computer will crash very, very quickly. Okay? That's the issue. The issue is this is an exponential problem, and so you've, we've written a beautiful formula. And conceptually, the color Jones polynomial can be thought of as just some linear combinations of Jones polynomials of cablings. That's true. But actually using this to compute anything it has proven to be useless. This method, the, the method of the jones ansel idempotence, Hitoshi showed us last night how it can be used to compute like a full expression of the color Jones polynomial for torus knots. And the R matrix point of view is used computationally, which we'll see later today. But this is clear conceptually and not useful computationally. OK, so these are the three points of view of the color Jones polynomial that I wanted to show you. And this is kind of like the, the idea. So thank you. No idea. I have no idea. Yeah. So, you know, uh, I think I'm going to say something wrong. Do you know the answer to this? Where are 6J symbols in this formalism? So all of, this, all of these quantum factorials show up um, in the R matrices. Right, so so the expression for the Jones polynomial is is the it's going to be some sum of products of R matrices. Every one of these R matrices is some ratio of quantum factorials. So the six J symbol fundamentally is a ratio of quantum factorials, and so somewhere in that sum of products of quantum factorials are are six J symbols lurking. That's the best I'm going to do. Hand wavy. Any easier questions? <laughs> oh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.